Thank you so much. Um, the topic uh, is really around uh, the kind of intersection which I'm really interested in working in, which is basically the intersection of data, visuals, and stories. Um, to kind of set the context for this, I, I would just kind of start with uh, a quote. Um, so we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are, right? Um, how many of you have heard the story of the blind man and the elephant? Okay, a few, few, not too many. Uh, it's a very famous story. Um, It's a very famous story told in many cultures, uh, told by Rumi in Albani, told in the Japanese culture, told in India, so across many of these cultures. And uh, the story really goes around in terms of the six blind men who are brought to see an elephant. And brought to see an elephant is really a misnomer because they can't really see. So they start to do what they can possibly do, start to feel the elephant and see what, what emerges or what they can understand of that. So the first one goes to the side of the elephant or is in the side and feels kind of like a very sturdy and broad uh, show, uh, side of the elephant and says that that looks like really like a wall. Right? The other one is in the front and feels a tusk and sees something that's very pointy and sharp and like a spear and says this definitely has to be a spear. The third one uh, grabs the trunk and seeing that it wriggles around and is pretty much feels and feels like a snake, says it's definitely a snake. The fourth one grabs the knee and feels the rigidity and the solidity in it, the ridges around it, it feels like a bark and says that's definitely a tree. The fifth one looks, is actually on the top and is grabs the ears of the elephant, looking at them, flowing from one side to another, feels this is definitely a fan. And the sixth one, by the time he's able to come there, is the elephant has turned, he can only reach the, the tail of the elephant, and then definitely says, this is a rope. So, uh, you know, we, and so these men of Hindustan disputed longer and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. Um, I don't know whether that sets the context of what we do in machine learning or data analytics to some extent, but uh, what we're trying to do uh, mostly around uh, in, the, in this world of data science is really trying to use data as a way of clue to the final truth, right? And I, I use the word clue very much like the blind man trying to figure out what an elephant looks like. It is really a clue to the end truth, and that's what we're trying to use that as a lens that we can probably understand the world through. So the data is a lens, and as any lenses would have with, they have their own powers and they have their own distortions, right? So what, the way I think about uh, data science or the way I think about applying this lens is through kind of a layer of abstraction, right? Um, If you were to try and understand a phenomena in real life, this is what we're trying to do in data science, whether it's somebody buying a, a product or somebody trying, uh, or, or any other aspect of data science that's happening, or any other aspect of real life, we're trying to understand that. And we can look at it in uh, three different ways. We can definitely look at the data that comes when we measure the real life, when we measure, uh, in this case, say the pendulum, the person swinging on the pendulum. Or we can think of that as a visual abstraction that we can then represent. Or we can think of the final thing as maybe a symbolic abstraction that we represent. And these, I say as abstraction, is there as representative of the phenomena that's happening. So they're close to the uh, real life phenomena, they describe it in the very way that data is a clue, but they do not fully capture it. Right? The way to think about this is that these are three layers of abstraction. And we're trying to understand a real life phenomena through these layers of abstraction. So the data abstraction, visual abstraction, and model abstraction 
Those are the three fundamental principles by which we work in data analytics, or we work in data science, to some extent, along with the story abstraction, is how we work to a large extent in real life forms. <coughs> geometry without algebra is dumb. Algebra without geometry is blind. And in my experience over the last uh, few years, trying to teach this topic, trying to talk about visualization, trying to talk about data science, I find a lot of people have a bias towards either one side of the abstraction. Either they are too, too much on the visual side, or they will prefer the visual side, or they are too much on the symbolic abstraction side, which is trying to look at uh, numerical summaries or outputs from there. And they both go hand in hand. They both go hand in hand, and that's kind of the thesis of uh, this talk, in the sense, how do we bring those things together uh, so that we can actually enhance the power of our learning through the models that we're trying to build. So, uh, to kind of build the context of what does it mean when we talk about model visualization, right? Um, let's take a very simple example. Um, and since we're in Singapore, let's take kind of like a financial service example, or let's play a trading game, right? And the trading game is really very simple. Um, uh, the trader is basically has to decide when to buy, hold, or sell a particular stock. Right? So he has only three options or three actions. He can either buy a stock, or he can hold to the stock at cash, or he can sell it. Right? And let's give him some starting constraints. Uh, so they probably have a stock of shares. So he's starting with about 1,000 uh, shares. So he has a starting point. So he has a portfolio that he's trying to manage, which is about 1,000 shares. And there is a price of the share. So the price is, at this moment, 100 Singapore dollars. Uh, so we have 1,000 shares. We have 100 Singapore dollars. And we have about 500 minutes of trading available in the day. So he's basically a day trader, which kind of fits in. Probably something in Singapore could be in that place. So we have these three constraints, and we start the clock. In some sense, we start to visualize the data. So the, we, when we visualize the data, um, we probably have an idea of, or we have a representation of what the data looks like. So this is the price of the stock as it goes over the 500 minutes during the day. And that, to some extent, is the data on which we're trying to build a map. Okay, so far with me? And as with a, a, a good practitioner of machine learning or data science, we started a very simple model. And the simplest model in this case is what I call the one minute strategy. The one minute strategy is every minute, I look at the price, and I do this. If the price is greater than 5%, then I sell my one share, one share out of my thousand. And if the price is less than 5%, then I buy my one share. So that's my one minute strategy. If it's somewhere in the middle, I hold. So I have my three actions. Every minute I take that decision. As a, as a good day trader, I should be probably watching it every minute. So I do this decision, and that's the model that I've done. So I can take the data that I had and build a model on top of it. So I can start with visualizing the model. And the first approach to visualizing the model is I want to visualize the model within the data space. In this case, the data space is minutes. So I try and understand what my model would look like uh, if it played on this data space. Right? So this is how my one minute strategy would play out. I would probably start at about 1,000 and by the end, and close to about somewhere in the middle of 7, 75 or so. Right? Uh, so this is the pattern based on the data that I have. That's the first step we want to, we need to do, and we very, very, we don't often do, is to visualize the model in the data space. Once you've done that, then you go to the second and the third step in visualizing the model, which is you start with varying the model parameters, or if you're learning tuning parameters, what do you want to say? You want to vary the model parameters so that you not only understand how the model works, you also understand the process of the field of the model that's happening. So those are the two other things you're trying to do when you're now in the next step. And to understand that, we vary the model within some bounds. Right? So in this case, we had a 5% up and down buy and sell ratio. We now move it to 
play a range from 1% to 10%. So we have 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, all the way to 10%. So we have about 10 parameters of the model, and we now see how the model performs in the same space. So the magenta line on this is the original strategy we had, which is the 5% one, and everything else is the range from 1% to 10%. So we now have 10 lines. So we're now visualizing the model, and this is really trying to build an intuition around how the model works, what's the actual fit of the model that is already happening, right? That's step number two and three. But we don't really stop here. Um, we are interested not only in one model, we are interested in the entire space of model that we can probably work with. Uh, so, we can add probably a hundred models, but since I don't work in that space, we'll add one more model. So instead of the one minute strategy, we're gonna add another model, which is now I call the two minute strategy. And the two minute strategy is basically, the price remains below that threshold for at least two minutes, then I execute my strategy. If it doesn't, then I don't execute the strategy. Right? So this is another model that has been built. And in, as in life, you, as in uh, doing this in real life, you would probably build many models. So you would add this space to the model space. So you'll add this model to the model space, and you now see what it looks like. So obviously we have the magenta line, which is the original one, and now we have got another 10 lines based on the new strategy that we have. So we're now trying to explore the process of model fitting. Um, and with this, we probably have an idea about how the model is performing, or at least these two models are performing on the model space, right? But we don't even stop here. We do one more thing. We visualize the model, this time, with different input data set. Because this is the strategy that worked on, or this is the output on that one particular input but the input or the data would also change. So we actually want to visualize it on many of these data. So we take another sample of data, or in this case, in this case this is a generated one, so we have five more generated data points, space, and we look at that to understand how the model will perform. And by now you can see that the model, you start to get an envelope of performance, clearly starts to emerge based on the strategies that you have, the two strategies, the range of the model parameters that you have, and the range of input parameters that you play around. So these five steps is what we've gone through to kind of build an understanding of how the model will perform on a basis. Does that make sense? Is anybody with me? Any questions? Just feel free to shout in the middle. You can check in the middle as a person in the end. Um, so this, in principle, is um, the model-based approach. To do a model-based approach, uh, we need to do kind of five things. We need to visualize the model within the data space. We need to play around with the varying model parameters. We want to understand the process of model fitting. We need to look at the entire model space that is there. And we're going to look at the model with different input data sets. If you're able to cover uh, these five aspects, we would have a fair bit of understanding visually uh, about how the model is performed. Okay. And then we can take some judgments rather. Right so, now model visualization is more of an art than a science, because even though this is how we went about applying this model visualization in this domain, this is fairly straightforward in this toy problem that I kind of talked about. The moment you go to a real life uh, machine, life, uh, machine learning problem, the uh, number of dimensions that you need to play around with, the number of um, the number of variables, the number of input parameters you need to play around, really explode. And visualization is even really good at understanding what I say, kind of the second level of ignorance, uh, which is I don't know what I don't know is not really good at scaling very well with data, right? So, it, it is more an art, and an art is also more so because it's not really developed at that moment that we have very clear developed strategies on an art data. The idea of model visualization is what you want to do in modeling, is basically aid the transition. I want to take out what is the implicit knowledge that I have about the data, or what is in my head, and 
in, in some way captured explicitly in my model. That is the process it's trying to aid. It's trying to ensure that the mental model I have about the data or, uh, or what I figured it out looking at the data or from my past experience is captured again in the model in some explicit way. And that, that is what we're trying to really build in. Right? Um, and this is important because the machine learning process goes through basically seven steps. You start with framing a problem. So you start with what is probably a good idea about what the scope of the problem that you're trying to solve. You then move to acquiring the data, which is really the hard part of uh, getting the data, and cleaning, uh, getting the data and figuring out an 80% of the effort probably goes in that part. You then refine the data, because data is inherently messy. And then you start transforming it, uh, because the data may not be in a way that you are able to process it. So this transformation to another scale is one important part, or one important part in the data uh, process. You explore, because you want to really understand the features before you can do play around with it. So I don't know what I don't know. And then you come to the modeling set. The modeling set is really the kind of the sixth step in the whole scheme because you then want to figure out a model that will actually represent. Once you've done these steps, you would probably come to the inside part, where you would explain what is happening in this process. Now, if you were to look back to our data abstraction, symbolic abstraction, and visual abstraction, you basically, in this whole loop, go through transformation, exploring, and modeling in a very much cyclical fashion, or in a continuous fashion. You transform the data, you explore it again, you transform the data, you model it again. Um, and that process is probably very strong. Um, that process is very strong uh, when you're doing traditional statistical analysis. But when you come to ML approaches, the uh, link between transformation and uh, visualization may is also weak, but the link between modeling and visualization is really weak. Because the ML approach is really a very uh, focus just on figuring out whether the predictive ability is really well or not. If the model is pre predicting well, I'm very much happy with it. I may be careful about how I assess it, but as long as the predictions are improving, I am biased to take the better model that, that there is. But in, in the process of doing that, what we end up generating are much, much more black boxes, where the model does really a good job, but I don't understand why something is happening. So the intuitive mental model that I have about why this is working or why this is not working is really falls out. So I have no way of capturing my real world knowledge into the model, because as I move to more and more complex uh, black box approaches, the ability for me to understand them goes away. The other is I don't really know whether there is long term sustainable in a way that if there's something fundamental that changes in the market or in the process that I'm trying to model, will this model system. And given my bias to some extent to explain rather than predict only or to, or to at least do both explorable explanation or explain as well as predict, it is really hard to take machine learning uh, models and lead them just like that because you really want to understand. What you want to do is to extend this link between model and exploration in a way that this uh, is even possible to do in ML. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So how does this link back to ML? Like, how does this link back to machine learning? Uh, the five approaches that I talked about at the start, uh, how do you visualize the model um, within the data space. It, it links very easily to dimensionality reduction. So the act of dimensionality reduction that we do helps us to also figure out ways to do what we can do within the data space. The act of varying model parameter is effectively what we're doing in feature selection. The act of understanding the process of model fitting is what cross-validation does. The playing around with the entire model space and figuring out in, in which combination uh, what works, or in some cases figuring out how to bring them together because the combined model may be better is what ensembles does. And to play around with different input data sets, and because in this case uh, we cannot generate data in the way that I generated in my toy example, we basically use bootstrapping to get that into play. So 
the modern ways uh, approach that I've talked about actually maps very nicely to uh, to these five aspects of machine learning. However, the tools to do this are really very lacking, both in Python uh, and also in R. Uh, so it is not really easy, and one of the things we try to do is to really start to build something that will allow us to do it. And we are really at the early stage of doing this. Uh, but the idea was to um, kind of see if we can build a model with library that can actually effectively allow us to do all these five aspects in a visualization, in a model visualization. So to uh, kind of share what we have done so far and then what the ideas we have, I'm going to take another example, uh, another toy example, but this time much more from uh, the classification, uh, much more from the machine learning side. Um, so this is an example of uh, predicting the quality of wine. So this is a data set from uh, UCI. Uh, you said data set uh, is about red wines, and it's about 1,600 observations on 12 patterns of 12 features. Uh, we have one target feature. So the one target feature, uh, which is basically based on sensory data in the sense somebody's evaluated the wine and figured out or a median, median evaluation of the wine has been put around to say, okay, is the wine good, bad, or in this case on a scale of three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, right? So we have one target variable which kind of looks like that. Uh, a bulk of the data is in the middle between five and six, so we do have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so somebody has made an evaluation about that and has left it uh, as a subjective or judgmental base feature. Then there are 11 features which are based on um, chemical tests to some extent, right? So you have features which are uh, 11 of them and I ordered them in a way, uh, we can talk about it later, but we ordered in a way that makes some sense in the sense alcohol is one distinct feature because it's wine, it is alcohol. Content is probably one of the things measured. Density in pH is uh, the other set. Residual sugar is another one which basically drives the sweetness of the wine. Uh, fixed acidity, volatile acidity, citric acid, these are all acidic components. Uh, and the acidity is driven by these aspects. And the inorganics, which are really the salt, chloride, and the sulfur, uh, free sulfur, total sulfur, and sulfates, really are the rest for uh, of these. So there are basically five categories of variables to some extent, and there are different measurements of this. Now, if anybody's ever tasted wine, they would know that the, the taste of the wine is really much more than just this chemical movement. It's, a, it's a much more of a balance between this uh, rather than um, rather than explicit variables, each one of them that you're trying to mention when you smell or taste wine. So how do you combine that into a machine model? And most of the uh, ideas that I've seen so far try and do a very dry ML approach which would be just put all the features together with very limited feature in the process. So uh, being on the waste side, you probably start with some kind of dual exploration. So I'll share a couple of ideas around it and uh, you probably start with uh, as some exploration around it in terms of how the alcohol or the quality uh, are linked together. So one of the variables in this case alcohol and the other one is very uh, quality. And you can clearly see there is some trend that you're trying to assess through that, right? So, uh, as a good student of ML, you'll probably go and do all set of these single variable explorations. I put one of them here to share, or a few variables. And then you'd probably add and do a much more of, let's say, three variable exploration. So, trying to see if there are three way uh, interactions there. And, uh, and really trying to see whether there is a pattern that comes out of this. And here, clearly, again, alcohol and volatile acidity. You can start to see some patterns. Clearly, the lower, uh, the, the worse off, uh, or the not so good wine from three and four are clearly at the top left corner. Uh, the better ones are clearly bottom right. So, you know, more alcohol, less acidity seems to be good for wine. Um, and you can continue to do this on two more devices, two wearable devices, as you would to explore and see whether they are patterns. Both, and you would do both numerical and visual exploration. Uh, you would probably end up doing some level of multi-dimensional exploration. So this is one of the easiest way to do ten-dimensional exploration, which is really around 
uh, putting them all in some parallel content and trying to see whether I can see some interactions around it. Right? So in this case, the colleague is available on the left, and you can see three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you can clearly see uh, six nodes there from which everything is coming. Uh, and if you link them together and select some of them, and you can say three or seven and eight, and you can start to see some interaction there. Right? So this is not really uh, still model This is still very traditional uh, multi-dimensional visualization. But the idea is to again build intuition around it. Right? To build intuition around it at least from the way the data is measured. We might get past from the data. To be more scopes to do that. Um, so what 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 possibly can you do? Um, Uh, a traditional ML approach could possibly be you know, linear regression, you throw in all of these variables together. Uh, and if you were to just do quality, regress quality on F alcohol, pH, sulfate, you'll get a model score of about 0.36. And then you can obviously you know, do much more uh, of the other techniques to do it. But the idea here is what can we do once we've got a model which is a linear uh, model around this? What can we start to see so that we can? build some more intuition around whether the model is working or not. The two techniques that you can see, uh, use is, say, visualize a model within the data space is really add the predicted data. So start to use the predicted data or the data generated from the model as any other variable in your data set. So that you start to play around with it, manipulate it, and figure out ways to visualize it. The challenge here is really around visualization. You can add the variable on top, but how do you find a way that you can effectively visualize it? Here is one way to do it. Um, you're still using quality. You're still using alcohol as one of the dimensions. Uh, but the black dots now are really trying to show the regression line in one one dimensional space that you are. Right? Uh, so once you put that another variable together, you can start to do the visual exploration again to start to build much more intuition around how this works, again, in money dimensions. So the moment you have added the predicted data back into, let's say, your data frame, it is another variable on which you can start to do exploration and start to see how that correlation happens. Or is it really getting explained away or not? Is the prediction really happening? And so everything that you could do on multi-dimensional visualization will start to apply to this software. That's one. The second is you can actually visualize the process of model training. And the most easiest way to do this, uh, which will apply across all models, is to play with residuals. Because all models, uh, irrespective of their complexity, as long as there is one target variable, will have a residue. Right? So if you have a residual, you can then uh, start to see how much of the residual is being explained. Uh, so what you're trying to do when you plot the residuals is you're subtracting the pattern from the data and seeing how much of that is going into the model, intuitively, right? As you keep reducing the residual, more of the more pattern from the data is going into the model, right? You don't want everything to go, because if your everything is gone, it's probably an overfitted model. Uh, you want a simple model that explains as much of the pattern as possible, right? So using residuals could be another approach. So here, instead of plotting the quantity on this side, now you've plotted the residuals. And you start to plot the residuals with alcohol in this case and start to see whether there is again any trend. So again, the residual is another variable that can be started to look at. And you can again start to see how which of this residual is going with any of the other variables and start to, uh, start to think about how you can uh, extend this, right? And you can again plot residuals in this case as the size of the bubble is the residual on two dimensions. So alcohol and methyl acidity, and you can already start to see some interesting patterns that you can probably explain. Wine, for example, is a mix, uh, is really uh, a balance between a lot of these components that I was talking about. Sweetness, acidity, uh, alcohol, all come together to probably form a taste. What we've done here is a simple linear regression of all the 11 features. Is there interaction effects that would be interesting if you combine them in ways that would start to explain some of this residue, right? So you can bring a lot of this uh, visual uh, uh, intuitive understanding that you have about the data and bring it to the data and try to start to visualize it 
and add this to your toolkit. So adding the toolkit, adding the predictive data, adding the SQLs is one way to do it. Um, and I'll share a one, a one or uh, two more. This is really a classification problem, right? I mean, we, we are using regression as our, but we can also think of this as a classification problem and start to uh, just classify it. And for simplicity's sake, we can start with a binding classification. So we take uh, three, four, five, put it in one class, so let's call it class zero, so the low class, and the class one, which is the better quality, or let's say premium quality line, is six, seven, and eight. Since our data is anyway five and six, that seems to be a equally balanced class we can pair up. So one of the techniques you would start to look at is alcohol and volatile acidity. So something getting, so I said, well, alcohol and volatile acidity, and you will plot it on a two plus problem. And you can already see, at least on these two variables, that um, you have something that you can uh, start to segment these two classes on. Right? Uh, the technique that you want to do with this is really be able to play with data with projections. Because I'm really looking at the two dimensional view, whether it's possible to look at this in three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, all the dimensions possible, uh, you may really to be able to do multiple projections. So how would the data look if you would rotate it in a, another projection? So this is now rotated in a projection one, projection two. And this obviously brings a lot of the dimensionality deduction techniques that you have. But what you really need in this and which Python doesn't have is really something that allows you to do guided tools, which allows you to look at this data in many different ways and be able to rotate it around and examine it and find the interesting patterns or be able to do it through manual intervention. So both either projection pursuits or guided tools that allow you to do that. And doing that projection would actually enhance, again, your intuitive understanding of how this model is uh, could possibly be explained. The final... Uh, approach that I'll just touch upon is really um, trying to think about, uh, once you've plotted, trying to understand the boundaries of that plot. Right? So this one, let's say for example, we start with a logistic regression and uh, we plot it. This is how the projection looks like, or the, sorry, the classification looks like uh, once we've done the logistic regression. So obviously there is a line. Uh, kind of like a line passing through that. Um, and we're just doing it on two variables in the case. We're not using the entire data set for simplicity's sake. So what we can do here is really evaluate the boundaries. And to evaluate the boundaries, there are only two methods to do it. Either you sample the data with border possibility. So where, if you were to look at this map again, but this time plotting in them the probabilities of one of the class, you can clearly see that the point five, so the purplish color, you can start to see the boundary is probably going to be there, right? So you can actually use that information and start to find these boundaries. It's easy to do in a two-dimensional space. It's getting very harder when you have three, four, five to do um, to find those boundaries and be able to play around it and put, plot it and start to rotate it to start to look at it in interesting ways. The easy way, at least for two dimensions, which is what I'm going to share, is create a mesh of the entire range of the data. The moment you create an entire mesh uh, of the entire range of the data, you can start to see the boundaries uh, easily. So uh, here is what a mesh would look like for logistic regression. So you've basically taken a range of data from zero to one in alcohol, and this is scale. And you can start to see this is how the mesh would look like for logistic regression. If you were to add, do this again for, say, something like QDA or quadratic discriminant analysis, uh, this is how you would, so you obviously have a quadratic curve which is separating it. And in two dimensions, it's easy to get this dimension. If you want to see an example of maybe overfitted data, then if you were to run a random forest unit, it would give you fantastic accuracy, at least for these two. Uh, and you can start to see how a random forest really overfits the data to show you, and you can clearly start to see some patterns. So creating a mesh to explore the data uh, and explore the boundaries and where these planes are intersecting is another very effective technique to do this. Now obviously mesh doesn't scale very well because in two dimensions your, your number of variables are still, number of data points are still limited. 
But at the moment you have to create an n-dimension mesh, the number of data computation required will be very high. So you need to probably go back to the sampling technique to create these meshes in an, or create those boundaries in an effective way and start to be able to play. Right. Now, so this is still uh, in early stage. Uh, there's some, we want to just share some ideas around uh, how to do this. It's not easy. Uh, a lot of these uh, approaches are not like, articulated very well. So uh, you need to pick up where and which data set these techniques work and try and build kind of a corpus of knowledge around doing this model virtualization in a way that actually aids the ML part of it. Uh, or AC assessment. And by no means I'm trying to say here that uh, we should not use computation as a way of taking care of a lot of this. I'm just saying we should need to bring both the visual part and the modeling part together in a way that helps us get a better understanding of it. Because there's still a lot of intuitive understanding that probably is not getting captured when we go in a very uh, black box. There is obviously cursor dimensionality in this space clearly, so the more uh, visualization doesn't scale any well, so we need to think about how to take care of that, which means we need tools like projection tools and projection ways to kind of uh, be able to do it. There is lack of interactive tools, so a lot of these tools really work well when there is interactivity built in. Uh, for example, the parallel coordinate that I showed was actually not done in Python, it's the only plot not done in Python. Uh, even though you can do parallel coordinates in Python, the interactive part was through a very old tool called Monfame, which does it very nicely. Um, and uh, Python doesn't seem to have that at this moment. And obviously there's very limited practice development on this topic around uh, Python. So what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, trying to create uh, two or three modules around this, one really around projections. So trying to see if we can figure out a way to do both the tools, as well as look at how to create these boundaries. Um, and then obviously bring in a way that in which we can do bootstrap and cross validation and get uh, be able to plot all those possible models and plot all those possible um, uh, input data to try and see if we can get learning from that. Right? And, um, so we're trying to build these mo three modules around it. Uh, this is the GitHub repo right now, which is pretty much uh, much right now designed. Uh, as basically Jupyter Notebooks trying to build these examples. And uh, the idea is to prototype it a little more and then maybe try and see if we can at least take one of them, at least the projection one to a stage where it can be used as a much more uh, standalone package eventually. Um, I, uh, yeah, I work in the intersection of data stories, and that's my contact. Yes, please. I had a question. So I understand that... Thank you. I understand how the visualization would help humans to understand what actually is happening. But do you see these visualizations actually going at the inputs to the whole machine learning process, or how does it enhance the machine? Yeah, at this moment, I mean, at least when I was thinking about this talk, it was still human in the middle kind of ideas in terms of um, in terms of how you uh, look at the visualization. But I think there's also opportunity if you start to take the predicted data as duals, you could also do some kind of autolysis or automatic analysis to again, you know, loop back to humans. What are the interesting views again in it, right? Uh, I am a visual person, to be honest, I'm really a small data person, as I call myself. And I really like to understand what's happening. Uh, and even though I'm happy to use all the tools that are built on, um, you know, automated, but uh, I like to be able to explain uh, rather than just predict. And I think when if, if you have problems, and I really feel in a lot of work that I do with corporates, uh, there are far more explaining problems in the business domain than just the few prediction problems that ends up taking a lot of the thing, a lot of the uh, focus. Um, and I think those explanation problems could probably benefit much more with them. Maybe, maybe image recognition or the TensorFlow talk that we looked at. Maybe, maybe not so much in that domain. 
So, yeah. uh, you were talking about the curse of dimensionality. I wondered if you had any foolproof methods for reducing the dimensionality. And the reason I ask you is, in your wine example, you had pH and three different types of acidity, which would all be correlated with each other. So I wondered if there's any sort of method for maybe striking out some of the variables. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, so there are uh, dim I mean, dimensionality reduction techniques that are already there. Um, and you you can definitely, you know, in this case, I think there are a couple of variables which are 0.6 or point even more than that correlated. And you can probably, you know, remove them from that data set and try and do that. But what, uh, and, and then try to map. So I think you can do it both statistically. And uh, the other way to do it manually, if you want to, is uh, kind of going up this dimensional plotting from single to double to projections and you know parallel coordinates and different ways to look at it and trying to see correlation visually if you want. To. I prefer that uh, at least for uh, at least at some scale. I mean, beyond a scale of you know ten variables, it possibly is uh, a human in mix would probably not be beneficial, and then you can go back to statistical techniques. On dimensionality reduction. At some scale, yeah, beyond 20, you know, there is no uh, no humanly possible for you to use visual techniques. So that's why visualization is great, but it doesn't scale beyond a point, and that's why we need better tools and we need better ways to do projections and all those techniques that are not really there at this moment, especially even interactive stuff, because it, interactive visualization was easy to create and we could create them very quickly to explore data, not for the idea of presenting, but just to explore, then we would be able, to, we would not think so much about spending time how to, you know, whether we want to create or not. Right now it's so expensive to do in time-wise interactive that we don't really go down that way. I did one talk uh, previously this session on uh, visualizing multi-dimensional data. So if anybody is on my website, you can go and see it's really around going up from one, two variable, three variable, all the way up to ten, and how you could do that with the results of the Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you.